Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hey there, guys. Welcome back to She Said Homestead. I'm Michaela from Calico Cow Acres. I'm Sage from Terranova Acres. We both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. And today we have my friend Chrissy here with us. She gardens and raises quail in her suburban backyard in Asheville. Yep. Hey guys. Nice to be on here. Happy to (laughs) be on the podcast. Before we get into the episode, Sage, why don't you tell us about your week? Mm, My week has been unexpected, to say the least. I woke up to a text message one day this week asking, hey, can you come pick up a couple ram lambs that you wanted? And I didn't realize that the creamery that I was buying them from was all the way down in Georgia. So spent a day going and doing that. And I now have two little lambs. One of them's having some trouble eating. So I get to get to sort of wrangle him and um, get him to drink his milk. He's doing better, though. There's progress being made. It's just something I haven't had to deal with before. And then today... I decided to get a livestock guardian dog puppy. It's been something that I've been thinking about. I haven't talked about it. I know when I shared with you, you were like, what? But <laughs> it never is a dull day here at Terra Nova Acres. <laughs> yeah, it's been something on my list and I knew I needed to do it now that I have a handful of sheep and I got kind of lucky last year, honestly, that I didn't have more issues. So biting the bullet on that and I will pick that dog up in a couple days we have zero like interest in having a dog whatsoever like I love dogs but they're just so much work and energy I can't do it last year we almost got one from tractor supply a livestock guardian dog for no reason because it's just like a little marshmallow and he's like I want it so when I told him that you were getting one of those today he was like when can I meet it like he's like I want to meet this dog and he said he might steal it so you need to keep a watch out on that between bottle feeding the lambs and meeting the new little floof of a guardian dog i'm gonna get you guys over here <laughs> yeah no we need to come over soon. what about you what did you get up to this week well we got new chicks and they're already huge <laughs> i feel like they've tripled in size in the last week um we haven't really done much else honestly at all this week i've just been downstairs staring at them <laughs> like feeding them treats and having them hop in my hands and enjoying them. And you just got those, you just picked them up impromptu from Tractor Supply, right? Yeah, I mean, we kind of planned to get them, but we went to our Tractor Supply and they had the breed we wanted, but they only had them in straight run. And then they only had like one other kind. So there's a Tractor Supply about 20 minutes from us. This was last Thursday, so exactly a week ago. And we're like, they're still open for another hour. Let's make the drive and go look. And they had that breed in premium pullet. So we got some of those. Uh, they're Starlight Green Egger. So we'll, we should get green eggs. We tried to get four, but then they gave us only two of those ones, we realized, after we got home. And we got Brahmas, which apparently are massive, and we didn't realize that. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, we think we have one of those. That's a rooster. <laughs> so really mm. excited about that adding more roosters uh what was the other one we got rhode island i think so they all have names and they're they got their wings and their little butt tail feathers they're really cute (laughs) so yeah that was pretty much my entire week was just taking care of and looking at and admiring little baby chicks uh chrissy (laughs) what were you up to this week well this week was a little bit crazy um i had recently quit my job to do beekeeping full-time And yesterday I quit my beekeeping job (laughs) because I just wasn't feeling engaged enough and kind of like the day to day. Also had only gone into the hives one time. Um, Granted, it's February, so that's pretty normal for the season. But yeah, going back to the renewable energy industry, which is where I was working before. But I'm very excited for spring. 
um, started my seeds this past week. Really want my quail to start laying, but we'll get into all of that, I'm sure. Remind me where you got your seeds from, because I knew I know you got a new seed source this year, but I can't remember. Yeah, in the past, I've always used Harris Seeds, which is just some random online supplier that has organic seeds. <laughs> and I would just like search for organic and then buy whatever's organic, and that makes it really simple. I don't really look at varieties or anything like that. This year, I really wanted to get into seed saving, and so I bought all of my seeds from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which specializes in seeds that do well in the Southeast, which is where we are, and only bought heirloom open pollinated seeds so that I can try to save them. And they also have some interesting seeds, like I bought um, sorghum, which is going to be cool to try because I wanted to try a grain that you can do in small spaces. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, growing a lot of like new stuff this year. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, sure. So my name is Chrissy. I live in Western North Carolina, very close to Sage. And I work in the renewable energy industry um, for my day job. And then outside of that, I am renting a house where I basically turn the whole backyard into a growing space. Um, I also raise quail for meat and eggs. And I keep bees. I have a few hives that are off of my property, just on someone else's land who's being very generous right now. And yeah, outside of that, I also have a dog. I have lots of different hobbies that are outdoors. So that's what I like to spend my time on. And we are friends outside of this podcast. That's one of the reasons that you're you're our first outside interview. And we met over Instagram. You guys heard the beekeeper story, how Sage dropped a beehive and someone had to come save the day? That was me. So, like Michaela said, it was a really great way to start a friendship. <laughs> Just get right into it. <laughs> um, before we get further into it, I do have a few rapid fire questions for you. Let's do it. <laughs> what is your favorite color? Blue. What is your most procrastinated garden chore? Oh, taking the compost out. Fair. It sits on the countertop for days and days and days and overflows. And my roommate will put <laughs> it outside on the porch and then I'll just fill up another bowl on the countertop and she'll take that one out. And then once it becomes like four or five bowls of rotting food sitting outside on the porch, then I'm like, OK, it's time. But I think if I lived alone, I have no idea when it would go out. So the roommates keep yeah. me accountable. You're a fruit fly farmer. We actually haven't had any fruit flies, shockingly, but it is an issue because if my roommate sees one fly, it's like all hell breaks loose. So yeah. we got to keep the bugs like really under control. <laughs> I feel like every time I go over there, she's like, did you see the fly? Yeah. Like, well, we no? also live in a hundred year old house that is not like sealed at all. That'll so. do it too. What is your go to snack? Oh, Milano double milk chocolate cookies. A good snack. So That's a quality good. snack. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Every How time you come over, I'm like, do you want some Milano? And usually you say no. I have <laughs> never been offered a Milano when I went to your house because I love Milanos and I would never turn down a Milano. That's false, but okay. We'll we'll have that conversation All right. outside of the place. Guys, moving on to, are you a dog person or a cat person? You know... I'm historically a dog person, but I feel like I've met a few cats lately, including the cat that was just in my lap, that have really changed my mind. Like, I think if I had a cat who just didn't lick themselves all the time and wanted to cuddle, it would be great. Hmm. It's the sounds that get you. Yeah. As it's, my cat is over here it's, bathing herself. Right. It's the misophonia. <laughs> I just, you know... It's too much. I don't know. Yeah, it just all have it. It makes me fly into an inexplicable rage. Um, and I don't feel like that's good as a pet parent. So I should probably <laughs> not get a cat. It's a good self-awareness. Yeah. <laughs> when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, at what age? I feel like it, for me, it probably changed every two years. Okay. Well, I think the first one was a veterinarian, like a lot of little girls <laughs> and then i wanted to be a therapist and then i wanted to be a neurologist and then i wanted to be a chemist and wow. then i wanted to be a homesteader <laughs> and a beekeeper and now we're here working in um sustainability but 
I wanted to be all kinds of things. I I get bored easily. Hence the homesteading. We know what that's like. <laughs> what does your ideal Saturday look like? Mm. Saturday is my day where I don't do a single chore. I don't do any work. And it's just my totally free day. And it's been like that for like three or four years now. And that's how I schedule my life. So usually, ideally, I would wake up early, drive out to the mountains, go on like a five or six hour hike, come back, rot in the bathtub for an hour, <laughs> and then either go out with some friends or just like stay in and hang out with somebody. Um, that's my ideal Saturday. And I know that you've taken a quiz to figure out what your core values are, but I can't remember what they are. Do you remember what they are? Um, I took a questionnaire when I started therapy with my most <laughs> recent therapist, which was probably the most productive exercise we did during the whole one year that we worked together. <laughs> and I don't know, I would say my core values are honesty, um, vulnerability, and honestly, that's probably it. I think honesty and vulnerability. I think when we talked about it, I know we talked about a few of the top ones uh -huh. like cuz there's, you know, you can rank them. And I think community Justice. community or friendship was up there too. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, my friends are very important in my life. Like relationships make life worth living. I think if we don't have relationships then what's the point? But that's just me. I think I think I could live without seeing another human being ever. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking <laughs> yeah. about in my, just right. in my episode, I was like, I don't yeah, like I don't talking like to people. So where specifically are you located? So without giving away too many personal details, um, I live in the Asheville, North Carolina area in a pretty suburban neighborhood. I am renting a house right now. And I actually measured out our growing space. And by our, I mean mine, because I'm the only one who does the work around the property. Um, and it is, if you include the walkways, it is 2% of an acre. If you don't include the walkways, it is 1% of an acre. It's impressive how much food I've been able to grow in that amount of space. It really is. Um, which is going to be the topic of today's conversation. <laughs> I think you mentioned that in the last video, the last recording, Sage. I threw that into my garden planning video. Yeah. Because it oh. was a section about growing in, in small spaces. Yeah, I think it's like 750 square feet is the whole space. And then again, if you take out the walkways, which is about half of it, right. then yeah, it's pretty small. <laughs> that's like just your flower beds. Yeah, it is. <laughs> And that's like my food. <laughs> I have to sustain off of that. Just kidding. There's an Ingles like five minutes from my house. I feel like you already answered what animals do you raise, but do you want to like go into it a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So I raise Caternix quail, otherwise known as Japanese quail. Um, they are a very domesticated breed of quail in the sense that they're not as flighty or aggressive as bobwhite quail which is what a lot of people use to train hunting dogs or they'll they'll raise a bunch of them and they'll just hunt with those they're also not as big as king quail which you probably see out in the wild and they have that little bloop like on the top that little feather um but they're basically just mini chickens they're very cute and when they hatch they're like this big and they're just little fluff balls so i love them <laughs> a lot but yeah i raise them for meat and eggs um, I started raising them in college, actually, in our college townhome in the living room. And I just because I we had a little backyard where I wanted to have two chickens and the landlord said, well, you can't have animals that live outside, but you can have animals that live in a cage inside. And I was like, OK, so I can't have phantom chickens outside in the yard where they can like be out in the fresh air and you know be less destructive to the property but i can have quail indoors where they're going to be super messy and you know but they were like yeah go for it so i ordered some eggs off ebay i bought an incubator on amazon it looks like like you know that's made in china it's like yeah <laughs> and i hatched them out and 
it was definitely an adventure. Um, would not recommend raising birds in your living room because I developed a cough from it that I didn't know what it was from for a long time. And it was from the dust, but it was fun. It was fun also because we would have people come over and they would be like, oh my God, there's like chickens in that. <laughs> you know? yeah, I was going to ask so. about the, the dust because I know that they can kind of do that. Also, how many eggs... How many quail eggs does it take for like a meal for you, like a breakfast? That's a great question. So one chicken egg can be made up by about four quail eggs. Um, so I usually would eat two chicken eggs for breakfast. So I would eat eight quail eggs. And that's why I got them originally. I wanted them to replace my chicken egg consumption, which they do during the laying season when they have at least 14 hours of sunlight. They produce a lot of eggs. And now I have a flock that's big enough that I have a lot of surplus eggs too that I can give away to friends or family. But it is kind of a pain because they're so small. <laughs> and so you have to use a lot of eggs for anything you're cooking, but also the membrane is really thick. And so you have to cut them with a knife. You can't just crack them on the side of the pan. So you have to cut every one of them and go bloop. And then like, it just takes a lot of tiny little eggs. But one of my roommates had never tried them before. And so we took one little egg, we cracked it, and we fried it up, put it on a little plate, and it was like a tiny fried egg. And then we cut it in half. <laughs> and he tasted exactly. it. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, it tastes like an <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I also raise bees or raise bees. I take care of bees. <laughs> I've been keeping bees probably since high school. Um, and I'm 24 now, almost 25. So you do the math. I don't want to do the math right now. <laughs> Being, be, keeping bees very on and off, just a few hives at a time. I've actually never harvested honey for many of my own hives because it's really hard to keep them through the winter. And I've also moved around a lot. I've been a renter for this whole time. So um, my bees are on another property where I had some friends who used to rent there and they said oh well this landowner used to have bees on the property so they had a bear fence and everything set up and here in Appalachia there's a lot of black bears so you need a bear fence um, and if you don't it's just a risk that your hives will get knocked over and destroyed because the bears are trying to look for the protein in there they actually don't really care about the honey they just want the larva so Anyways, very generously, he said, yeah, you can put your hives on our property. And so I have them there. If anyone listening to the show wants to do something like that, you can always reach out to your local beekeeping association or you can post on Facebook or Reddit and ask, hey, does anyone have land that I could use for beekeeping or even gardening? Um, I did that when I was living in Denver and had some generous people in the city who had a little piece of property who were going to let me garden on it ended up not taking the offer but that's always a good route too if you don't have your own growing space and you don't even like honey like oh, even if you right. harvested it you what would you even do with it i don't no know way. just look at it i think it's really pretty <laughs> um I mean, I really appreciate how honey is made. I think the statistic is something like one worker bee will make a teaspoon of honey in her lifetime. And during the summer, worker bees only live maybe six to eight weeks. Um, and then in the wintertime, they can live for several months. But when they're expending all that energy, yeah, they make a very small amount of honey. And so once you learn about bees, they're so fascinating too. But you really start to appreciate how many bees and how much effort it takes just to make like one little jar of honey. Honey is, it's kind of like wine, you know, every floral source, every region has a different flavor from the nectars from, you know, was it a dry season or a wet season and where exactly did the bees forage from? And so every batch of honey is different. And so it's really interesting if you're like a foodie or you're into flavors like that. It's just a cool thing. Bees also produce the only naturally occurring wax in nature. Um, naturally occurring in nature, yeah. <laughs> and they're just really fascinating little creatures. So I have a collection of honey from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, and it's cool. But yeah, I don't like it. I think it's too sweet. <laughs> we can have a whole yeah. podcast just on beekeeping. Oh, yeah. There's we so will. many different kinds of hives. Yeah, and We'll be back. So do you consider yourself to be a homesteader or would you use a different label to describe yourself yeah let's get into this question I, I love this topic um so I do not consider myself a homesteader I think there's a few different factors that go into that 
One, I think due to the fact that I don't own my land and I'm not dependent on my land for sustenance. To me, when I think of the word homesteader, I, I'm a very literal person. And so I go back to the very literal definition of homesteading, which is like pioneering, you know, settling new untouched land and literally living off the land. Um, I guess the more historical definition of homesteading. So personally, I don't identify with that because homesteading and those sorts of hobbies for me are just hobbies. It's not my lifestyle per se. Um, maybe if I owned my own land and I had more animals and I was actually depending on the land for my food, then I would consider myself a homesteader. But I think I actually identify more with the word farmer, which also doesn't make sense in light of what I just said, because <laughs> farming, as Joel Salatin would describe it, is like an agricultural business. And so I'm not selling my produce, but my approach to producing food is very much an optimization equation. And it's how can I maximize the number of calories that I'm producing in the least amount of space possible with the least amount of resources and the least amount of time with the maximum happiness for my animals and minimal impact on the environment. So all these variables. And to me, that's very much um, like a kind of farming mindset that's production based as opposed to lifestyle based. So then I'm curious what your thoughts are on the term hobby farmer, because you've mm. used it to describe, you know, those are those are your hobbies and you have more of a farming mindset. Would How do you feel about that label? I would call myself a hobby farmer. Yeah. But I think someone who actually had a farm would probably look at me and be like, you don't deserve that label, you know, because... Nah. I'm from the city. I'm from the burbs. How long have you been raising quail and beekeeping and all of the, the gardening things? Hobby farming. Yeah, so I started gardening first. I got interested in gardening. We had a garden when I was a kid growing up, but I was never really involved with it. I think I was too young. I remember like harvesting blueberries. We had some blueberry bushes. <laughs> and seeding grass, you know, but I was never really interested in it as a kid for some reason. But then when I was a teenager, I had this really formative experience at this wilderness skills camp out in Portland, Oregon, like in the foothills of Mount Hood. And I was there for four summers, basically. And this camp, it was a lot less like Boy Scouts, where you're trying to conquer nature and learn how to survive, and a lot more so building a relationship with the Earth and Mother Earth and the symbiotic relationship with the, the forest and like providing for each other. Um, and so as a part of that, I started to learn some plant identification. We did animal husbandry. We had sheep that we had to take care of and we would take out to pasture and chase them back every day. We did a lot of like soap making, bread baking, um, trapping. And so we did all kinds of things. So anyways, when I got home from that, I got interested in growing my own plants. So I started with some really easy plants. I started with herbs, I think mint, <laughs> and then maybe some other herbs, but mint is really easy to grow. Like, it's way too easy to grow. Harder to kill than it is to grow. Yeah, well, I did end up killing it because I brought oh. it inside and I thought that it would survive indoors mm -hmm. in the winter under just like a random uh, fluorescent light bulb, which <laughs> was not enough light. Um, and it did end up dying, I think. But it came back the next year with a vengeance. Um, so you didn't really kill it. Yeah, but I started just gardening in containers also because I was in high school and I don't know, we didn't have land you know my parents had a tiny little lawn in the backyard of our town home and they didn't want me to dig <laughs> in it and then when I was in college I didn't have any space really to garden until I moved into another town home and then during COVID actually it was not related to COVID I knew that I wanted to convert all of our backyard space into a garden but I think because I started gardening during COVID it really made me realize how therapeutic it was for me and how much I need it. So, you know, for me, it's a hobby, but it's also 
something I just feel like I need in my life and my life is better off when I'm gardening. So I started with just some raised beds because I knew that, you know, I wanted it to be impermanent. If I moved out of that property, which I was a college student, so I was going to move out of that property. I wanted to be able to remove the garden. So I built raised beds. I hauled in compost. So, you know, we put sticks and leaves and compost, the whole Kugel culture idea. And then I decided to kind of go off the rails and just dump all the excess compost on all the remaining grass. So, um, oops. <laughs> but I didn't dig anything. It was no dig, technically. I don't think I even owned like a shovel or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no dig maybe not by choice but yeah yeah necessity. yeah due to yeah poverty yeah so no dig um bought some transplants in may and put them in the beds and it was really fun so that's when i started gardening and then with the beekeeping like i said i started doing that in high school have been doing it very on and off usually with other people's hives and then now since living in Asheville, i've been fortunate enough to have my own hives finally after doing it for years in college, I had a bunch of beekeeping equipment that I couldn't put anywhere. And so we just used it as furniture. It makes a really good like side table <laughs> or a coffee table or a TV stand because <laughs> they're just boxes. They're just wooden boxes. I use Langstroth hives. And then the quail, like I said earlier, I started raising them in college as well. Yeah, it's only really been in the past few years. I've only been gardening and doing all this stuff for probably three seasons. I think this will be my fourth season. Yeah, I'm hooked. So describe your hobby farm set up a little bit more to people who've never seen it. Yeah, sure. So like I said, I am renting a house in the suburbs. Um, so we don't have a lot of space, but we do have a small front yard and a small backyard. Both of them are partially or mostly shaded um, during different portions of the day. So when I first got there, I really had to look at like, sun chart to make sure that I was planning out my garden in the again, most efficient way possible. So in the front yard, I have two raised beds just because when we asked the utility people to come out and mark the lines, they marked an internet line under the ground there. And I didn't want to dig there and risk like hitting that line. So there's raised beds in the front that are both four by six. So decent size um, that also have a trellis on one side, um, which is literally just to T post or U post and then a metal like conductor pole, not pole, um, tubing connecting them with PVC pipe connecting the tube. So then the backyard is rows, basically. Um, all of our soil is very heavy red clay with a bunch of debris in it because our house is 100 years old and right next door there's a brand new house and so our theory is that when they built the brand new house they just threw all of the construction debris into our yard <laughs> so i've pulled out like giant chunks of cement from our soil i've pulled out so many rocks there's gravel like there's all kinds of you know glass there's so much junk in there but i basically just have rows that are 30 inches so again it's very much market style gardening all I had was a rake from Lowe's and we just whacked, we whacked that soil. It's, it's very, very low tech, <laughs> my setup. Um, I do have a shovel now, though. A um, broad fork? It, well, yeah, this year I bought a broad fork because I was like, I'm not whacking all that soil again. Um, although I did still whack it to make the particles smaller. And then we brought in bulk compost that got dumped and then spread and mixed in with a broad fork to probably the first six inches of the soil and then put pure compost on top and then mulch in the pathways, just like a hardwood mulch. Um, so I have four, I have four beds that are... <laughs> probably again 30 inches wide and maybe 15 or 20 feet long i think they're 20 feet long and then another two beds that are weirdly shaped because one part of my garden is a square and then another part of my garden is a triangle so those beds are just really irregularly shaped <laughs> one is like six feet wide and <laughs> 10 feet long and then another one is 30 inches wide but then it goes into like this l shape and then there's a raised bed in the middle where it was all just gravel so I literally couldn't 
dig there at all. So I put a raised bed because I wanted a strawberry bed because I love strawberries. And, and so now you're overrun with them. I'm going to have so many strawberries this year. I'm And ecstatic. I'm going to take all of your extra little runners and oh, yeah. put them in my garden. Absolutely. Yeah, sharing is caring. So <laughs> it, it's a very small setup. And then my quail are in a cage that is essentially a shipping crate. <laughs> when I lived in Denver and I had my quail there, I literally found an old shipping crate on Craigslist, like off the road. It was on the free page of Craigslist, just like a box that was one foot tall and two feet wide and then six feet length. And I put hardware cloth on all sides and then I put landscape fabric on the bottom and straw inside so that the quail are not walking on wire because to me, that just doesn't feel very ethical. I don't want my animals walking on wire, um, especially with birds. Their feet can get really cold. And if you live in a cold climate, they need somewhere to keep their feet warm and dry. And we were having snow. So my quail are on straw, but they're in a fully enclosed cage. We've also had problems with raccoons <laughs> where I live. No other predators, thankfully. No bears have come into the, the um, you know, suburban house. But I have one pen for my laying flock, and then I have another stacked quail cage for my meat birds um, when I'm growing them out. And for anybody who might not be familiar with quail, hearing that it's only a foot tall might might sound really tiny. Yeah. And I'm sure you can speak to that reasoning a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So with quail, because they're they're not very domesticated, they flush when they are scared, which means they fly straight up at a really high speed. And so a cage for quail has to either be between 12 and 18 inches tall, ideally no more than one foot, or six feet tall, so that if they fly directly up, they will slow down before they hit the top. Because if it's any height in between that, they can break their necks on the top of the cage. So I've had them actually in a two foot tall dog cage, um, which wasn't really an issue because the bars are pretty thick and they're covered in plastic. So I've never had my birds injure themselves on that. But I have actually had them injure themselves even on the one foot cage, just mm -hmm. like jumping and bonking their heads on it. Um, they're not very smart, but they're very cute. And they're very quiet too, which makes them really good for like stealth <laughs> homesteading because my neighbors didn't even know that I had them until they were like, yeah, we were wondering why this giant hawk was sitting on the banister just staring at something <laughs> under the porch. And I'm like, oh, I'm raising tiny birds down there. So that's why the hawk is staring. And that's why the quail weren't laying for a few months. Oh, wow. Yep. So you talked a little bit about initially quitting your job in the renewable energy career to pursue a career in beekeeping and then sort of getting into that, at least where you were able to get your foot in the door and then maybe realizing that wasn't so much the path that you wanted. I'm curious, you know, what what's your why behind these hobbies? And then what were some of the reasons behind those more recent decisions that you've made with just the general structure of your life? Great question. Well, I'm still figuring out what I want out of my <laughs> life to be completely transparent. For me, homesteading and these hobbies have always been a bonus thing. It's never been a goal of mine to make that my full time job or my full time sustenance. I've always thought that I'll work a full time job in an industry where I can really make the world a better place on a big scale and use the skills that I've built up over the years to do that in the way that I can best um, or most effectively, which I feel like is in the clean energy industry or sustainability in a more like traditional job setting. Yeah. And then I would use that income to fund my hobbies, which would be owning land, having a garden that's like two acres big and having a mini dairy cow. And, you know, I have a lot of big ideas for what I want out of a hobby farm or a homestead. But I, I love homesteading because it's this never ending well of knowledge. There's a million different avenues you can go with it. There's a million different configurations. I think you guys were talking about this recently. And for someone who loves just sitting around and thinking really hard, that is so <laughs> much fun for me. <laughs> but it's also very therapeutic because you have to get outside and put your hands in the soil. And for me, that's not necessarily my nature. 
I think for me, that's that's kind of out of my comfort zone, but it forces me, like if I have animals to take care of or a garden to take care of, it forces me to go outside and do those things. And after I do them, I feel way better. And when I'm doing them, my brain turns off. And it's one of the only times where I feel like I get a full break. So that's why I homestead to me again, it feels like it's almost like going to the doctor or going to therapy. It (laughs) feels like a supplementary thing that I do that really improves my quality of life. And growing food for other people is like the most joyful thing that I've ever experienced. It's just amazing. And also growing something from seed and then harvesting it later, like there is nothing like eating a tomato right off the vine on like a hot August day. It is, it's just, it's amazing. So that is also why I homestead. (laughs) But yeah, in terms of my career, I'm still figuring it out. You know, I'm young, I've got time to wiggle waggle and you know life is long right um i'm sure i'll make some other drastic decision in another six months yeah (laughs) you're in your mid-20s you're you're very much allowed to be figuring out your life i mean we're allowed to do that at any age but that's normal yeah i mean four months ago we were talking about me potentially living in a tent on sage's land um and then buying my own land to build a house from scratch and go off the grid so you know i trying to keep up with my own brain i'm not really sure what's going on (laughs) um but yeah check back in in another year and i'm sure i'll have some other crazy plans so (laughs) we'll we'll check back in with your seed saving escapades and whatever else you're doing at that point okay so i know you don't have everything figured out yet but do you see yourself homesteading or hobby farming long term yes it's definitely something I think I could live without if the circumstances were right you know for example if I had a partner who I was like really in love with and she really wanted to live in a particular place where we couldn't have a lot of land then I think that would be fine because that to me is a more important life goal like having a family but I do think that wherever I go no matter where I live I want to have a garden. I want to have animals. I want it to be the one constant in my life that follows me wherever I go. Because again, I know that if I create that space for myself, it's therapeutic. It's somewhere I can escape. No matter what else is going on in my life, I can control that one space. (laughs) And I can also produce my own food that I know where it's coming from and it's clean. um, And that gives me a lot of joy as well. But yeah, so I think in terms of long-term homesteading plans i would love to have a property that's probably around five acres i don't think i need more than that because then it would just get out of hand with like cattle and (laughs) it would start to get too crazy (laughs) because you can always have more land right you'll find something to fill it with but i think for me ideally i want to be able to produce 100 percent of my own food off the land yeah which probably requires more than five acres however The fact that I've been able to produce a lot of my own produce, most of my own produce, especially during the growing season, off of 1% of an acre (laughs) gives me hope that if I had a whole acre garden, oh man, it would be optimized like crazy. Um, And then, you know, grains and starches and meat and dairy are the things that I really need to work on and kind of explore next. But a lot of those things require more space. So that's the tricky thing for me but i do eat a lot of meat so i think a lot of calories could come from that follow-up question on the desire to get all of your food from the land Mm -hmm. right aim for that so when you when you say that does that encapsulate like all your fats does that encapsulate salt does that encapsulate literally everything that you eat i mean okay not salt probably not olive oil um but but produce and meat yeah. And dairy. And grains. Okay. I think that's achievable. I mean, my cooking style is very simple. I don't bake almost anything. I'm just now learning how to make bread. <laughs> um, but I never <laughs> bake desserts. Um, I don't even know how to make cookies from scratch. So sugar is not really something I buy. I don't really buy, I don't know, just like processed 
things that are already made. I make most of my food from scratch already anyways. What do you think you'd have to, have give, to up give up if you wanted to live completely off your land besides like salt? I would really, for well, I'd have to give up the Milanos, first of all. <laughs> I would also have to give up cold SpaghettiOs right out of the can, which is Oof. my survival food. <laughs> When I just cannot be to cook anything and I need calories right then and there. That is what I grab. I have SpaghettiOs with meatballs. Cold SpaghettiOs hit different, okay? I haven't had them in years, but I love cold SpaghettiOs. It's just because I'm lazy to put them in a bowl and put them in the microwave. Like, that's the real reason. Um, they're, they don't taste better, you know? <laughs> I don't feel like I would be giving up a lot, to be honest. Um, I really can't think of other ingredients that I use on a regular basis that I need from the store when i've been around and seen what you're cooking at least from my perception it's heavily influenced by like bulgarian food because that's your heritage right and so that's it's right. it's what is that it's a lot of yogurt um lemon mm. um i don't know i i would call it simpler food but i don't see say that in a derogatory way no it it is very simple food um everything from scratch i cook the way that my mom cooked when I was growing up, basically, we're from Bulgaria, Eastern Europe, and yeah, the food is very simple. I, I mean, I can tell you right now, I eat tomatoes, cucumbers, onions, garlic, peppers, potatoes, lettuce, bread, rice, pasta, which is just flour and eggs, meat, lemon. But that's kind of it. Yeah. You can make a lifetime of meals just with those 10 ingredients. I want to level up my food preservation skills enough that I am first able to meet the needs of my household through what I grow on the land. And then if there's excess, sure, like give that away or, you know, even preserve it for later. Um, but I, I don't think I would grow food specifically to give away what is your general philosophy for your garden like do you prioritize no dig organic fertilizing um in a specific way or do you have goals for that in the future because i know you have a few different kinds of beds right now so it might be different than what you want to do i suppose yeah definitely i i think it is different than what i would want to do but generally i try and follow regenerative or sustainable agriculture practices as much as possible i don't use almost any like chemical inputs on my garden i do use a little bit of organic fertilizer um for my heavy feeders like potatoes and tomatoes i, I i've never tilled my garden except for when i've created the beds because the clay is so heavy and i wanted to get them into production that season so yeah, so that so that's why I broad forked. I was whacking with a rake, like getting those clay particles as small as possible and then mixing in with the organic matter to try and get them into production. Ideally, I think I would like to have maybe a slower process like sage, but also that's where the, you know, off farm income comes in. Because if I have a day job where I can make more money, then I can afford to get my garden going faster by using inputs. Compost mulch um i yeah i mean again like i said i follow market gardening really closely um but all organic um i try and use um all biological pest control um so pests eating other pests um i do try and create my own compost but it's at such a small scale that it doesn't really compost it just kind of cold compost and rots in the corner of my garden <laughs> and eventually all the food rots and just like becomes soil but it's not a pile big enough that i can actually like sustain my own compost needs off of that um so i am buying compost every year and spreading it over my garden which is not ideal yeah and i do broad fork twice a season once in the spring and one in the fall i think probably after two or three years of doing that i would stop um and not be 
broad forking and try and go to no dig in those beds. I'm curious, what are the things that you do specifically to get the most out of the space that you have? Because you are operating in a small space and Mm -hmm. you are trying to optimize it. So does that mean that you're breaking, you know, traditional spacing rules? Does that mean that you're interplanting? Mm -hmm. What do you do to address that? Right. Yeah. Good question. So I've been mentioning market gardening a lot, but I haven't actually been elaborating (laughs) on what that means. Curtis Stone is like a big influence of mine with that philosophy. Also, Jesse Frost from No-Till Gardeners has a commercial, large uh, market style garden. And basically that just means you're flipping beds really fast. Um, You're following soil health practices like keep the soil covered, always plant something in something else's place, um, which I'm not very good at. I'm always trying to succession plant. I am interplanting. So under my tomatoes, I might have beans and trying to use every layer of the canopy to like maximize the sunlight that's coming into my plants. I also really utilize vertical space which is super important for me, especially when I had a really small garden. I was growing everything up. I tried growing pumpkins on a trellis last year, and that actually didn't go very well because the pests got right to the the, the base of the stems. But vertical space is a huge thing. And I also manage my garden a lot more closely. Like I go in and I trellis everything. I prune everything. Like I do a lot more hands-on work in the garden um i water constantly (laughs) but you know so there's trade-offs right those are those are the practices i use and i do space everything really close together like i look at the spacing rule and then i'm like we could probably do closer than that and i kind of just it's always an experiment i'm always squishing everything as close as possible to see what will happen and usually it turns out really well um, and if you look into biointensive gardening, um, it makes sense because the roots of the plants feed, you know, the soil organisms that then in turn feed the plants again. Um, it holds the soil together. It improves water retention. It reduces weed pressure because the weeds can't get any sunlight and grow. So I just grow everything really close together. And I just... I use a lot of inputs, I guess, a lot of compost, a lot of water, and growing everything up. What is your general philosophy when it comes to raising animals? I would say similarly to the garden, how I try and raise my produce (laughs) in an organic way or the most sustainable kind of ethical way that I can reasonably while also getting like enough yield. The quail is similar. I'm really limited on my space, but I still want to produce enough eggs, at least, to cover my egg consumption, and then as much meat as I can, um, as much meat as I can handle to emotionally, like, butcher, (laughs) you know? I raise them in a small space. I would ideally like to have them on pasture, but with quail, that's difficult because you have to build a really tall, really expensive structure with hardware cloth all the way around in an aviary basically so that no predators can get in it would attract my neighbors to be like what is that it might also attract some thieves we've had people steal you know do like petty theft in our neighborhood and so i don't want to attract a lot of attention to the animals i'm raising also because i'm in the city and i looked in the city code before i well I was going to bring my quail anyways, but I did look at the city code to make sure there wasn't any explicit restriction on raising birds for livestock. And there are some regulations regarding chickens and the size of the property that you need to have chickens or goats. Um, There's some people in my neighborhood who have goats, actually, which I just recently learned. Um, It's interesting because all the houses are very close together. But there was nothing about quail. And so I say, if there's no regulation about it, you're probably good for now. And don't raise a lot of attention to it. So my quail are under the porch, essentially. It's where it's a covered space. They're protected from the rain and the wind and the snow. But they're in a fully enclosed cage, you know? So they're not foraging for insects. They're not digging through grass. They're not in the sunshine all the time. It's not a perfect situation, but they're definitely happier than 
if they were being raised in battery cages, fully on wire, and in really small spaces where they wouldn't have enough room to stretch their wings or lay down in the sun, or if they were indoors, some people raise quail in their basement on wire. And to me, that's just too uh, industrialized, I guess. It, to me, that doesn't feel very ethical. But again, do what you got to do, right? I, I I respect however someone wants to raise their animals, but um, to me, that just wouldn't feel good to be bringing an animal into this world and hatching it just for it to have that quality of life doesn't feel great. Um, so I do what I can. What about the bees? I know mm. in the beekeeping community, it can be a, a big thing about, you know, whether you treat your bees, whether you don't, how often do you treat them? What are you doing to test them? Yeah. I thought well, you were going to ask if she would keep them in her basement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, think that would work. <laughs> I would love to have the bees on my property. Um, the reason they are on a different property is because the houses are very close together where I live. Every house around ours has little kids. And I don't want some parent knocking on my door because their kid got stung by a bee. And they said, well, you have bees. So they must be yours. And I say, well, how do you know it was my bee that stung your kid? <laughs> I just don't want that liability. If some someone goes into anaphylactic shock, I don't want that liability. So my hives are in a much more rural setting, I'll be, although it's still, you know, somewhat suburban. With bees, you know, there's so many different ways to raise them. And again, we could have a whole podcast about treating, non-treating. I I have complicated feelings about that. On one hand, I want to support natural selection and say that, well, if you don't treat your bees, eventually they'll grow to evolve, you know, co-evolve with this varroa mite pest. And then one day, many generations later, it won't be an issue anymore because we know that antibiotic resistance is a real thing. And, um, you know, the, the selective pressures of medications can have the opposite effect that we want from them. But it's also like asking if your dog had a tick the size of a football on its back, would you just not take it to the doctor? You know. So from that perspective, you have to think about the ethical side of, well, this is an animal that now you're putting in a box, you're taking it out of its natural setting where it has its natural, more natural defenses. You're putting it in a very artificial environment, so it's more vulnerable, and you have to now treat it like a domesticated animal that can't really take care of itself like it would in nature. So I'll just leave that there. <laughs> and the potential for, you know, if you choose not to treat your bees, it's then interacting with all the other bees from all the other hives, and then, you know, potentially or likely contaminating other bee colonies, which is a huge issue. Right, which can be an issue with other livestock too, like chickens that are free ranging and they might walk on your neighbor's property. But yeah, bees obviously you can't pen them in, right? So you have to be really mindful of your neighbors and the other way around too. If your neighbors are using pesticides or herbicides on their garden, it can really affect your bees. So they're a very wild kind of livestock in that way. But yeah, I try and be mindful of how many hives I'm placing in an area where there might be a lot of other beekeepers with other hives because honeybees are very opportunistic foragers and they can forage from a lot of different nectar and pollen sources and they can actually outcompete native pollinators which is why they're not very good for the environment <laughs> at the end of the day they're really good at pollinating they're really good at producing honey and now because of our monocrop agricultural system we need them to produce a lot of the crops that we're growing in these giant again artificial systems but we don't need honeybees. I'm going. Yeah. I'm going on the record. The honeybees are a okay. All right. We we're not gonna. You know, our society at this point will would suffer if we didn't have honeybees because we've screwed up our agricultural systems so deeply that now we need them. You know, it's complicated. Producing yeah. food at scale that's unsustainable produces unsustainable dependencies. Right, and that's yeah. what we have now with honeybees. We were kind of just talking about how we both feel like we need to be cautious about how many honeybees we bring onto our property because we don't want to outcompete our natives. We have a lot of native bees here and I'm still concerned about it. Like 
in the spring it's hard not it's hard to walk without stepping on them there are so many Uh, which is a good thing but it like makes me nervous i don't want them to leave how much did you grow up in this lifestyle i know you said you had a garden but didn't really participate did you ever have any animals did you ever have an opportunity to really like roam free on a bunch of land or were you always very suburban um I definitely didn't grow up learning these skills. I did not grow up learning to garden or can or certainly not butcher meat animals. And so I'm teaching myself all of these skills. We did have an acre and a half of land when I was growing up as a kid in North Carolina, but I was just kind of playing outside and mowing the lawn, you know. (laughs) We weren't growing our own food for sustenance it was just kind of a fun thing that my mom was doing so yeah we did have a dog growing up so i guess you know that's one non-productive animal that I because my dog is a he's emotional support that's his function and he does a very good job of that but no it's all new skills i will say though my family grew up during socialism in bulgaria and at that time there was not a lot of options for food and the only food that you could get in the winter was food that was canned, right? So either you grew it yourself and you preserved it or you bought it from the store as a preserve. Um, there, there was a very limited selection of like imported goods. And so if it kind of skipped my parents' generation. So my parents don't really know these skills. But if you go back one generation further to my grandparents, they knew how to grow produce from seed. They knew how to maintain a garden. They knew how to preserve meat and produce, which is also kind of terrifying to me because I don't think my grandmother had a pressure canner. I think she just water bath canned everything and just put like fat on top of meat to preserve it, kind of like duck confit rebel canning yeah which i personally am not gonna do ever but i know some people do that and they say they don't get sick from it so you do you but yeah so it's interesting you know like i i do feel like it's kind of in my heritage like my people have been doing this for so (laughs) so so long and it literally is about to get lost in my generation and I feel this responsibility to like hold on to those skills because if I don't do it like my brother is my only I only have one sibling he doesn't do any of this he's very quintessential city millennial like it has nothing to do with growing his own food or anything like that so if I don't do it it's literally gonna die out in my family and if I don't grow the food that we would eat in bulgaria to make bulgarian meals like that is going to die out too and so i think that cultural heritage that goes along with food is really important to me and i want to preserve that garden wise what is your favorite thing to grow okay so my favorite thing to grow is green beans because it is the first thing i ever grew they're very easy to grow if you throw a bean in the soil and you just water it once or twice and it's warm outside it will grow and a bush bean can produce like 30 pods of green beans and if you just ignore it and it gets a moderate amount of rain and sunlight you'll have a harvest um so beans to me are like the gateway (laughs) produce the funny thing is i can't digest beans and so i really like growing beans because they're such a like low effort high reward crop but i get such bad stomach aches when i eat them but i eat them anyways because i grew that and what am i gonna do just not eat it um also because they you know fix nitrogen in the soil so i grow them for that too that's what my face was when she when she said that answer. That wasn't a judgment of green beans being her favorite. <laughs> that was a judgment of I know that you can't eat that. You have bees for you have honeybees, but you don't eat honey. <laughs> and your favorite thing to grow is beans, but you can't eat beans. <laughs> right. 
I don't know. I just like I the it. act of doing it. What is your favorite thing about this lifestyle in general? There's there's a lot of things. I think for me, like I mentioned earlier, it's very therapeutic. And I think you said this in one of your recent podcasts, but you can do whatever you want, right? I think I don't consider myself a creative person per se, but the fact that I can let my mind run wild with this optimization equation that is my <laughs> food production is really fun for me. And no one is going to get mad because I produce too much food. You know, <laughs> everyone's like, oh, that's really cool. They're not like, oh, you should calm down or like you should tone, tone, it, tone it down a little bit, you know, which is what I tend to experience in other parts of my life sometimes. So I really like just being able to go full speed ahead. Um, with the garden or pull it back if I need to, because I've definitely gotten burnt out with it before. And balancing that is tricky, but I kind of see it like a long term relationship. Like, I really love raising my own food, but sometimes I don't like it. <laughs> but it's worth sticking with because um, I know it's good for me at the end of the day. What has been your biggest challenge with the lifestyle in general so far? I think two things one growing in small temporary spaces has been a big challenge it's a challenge that i've tried to solve for since day one i think my first book i ever had on gardening was square foot gardening mm -hmm. um and so that's a method that i started with which again really emphasizes using every inch you can mixing your produce together to minimize diseases using vertical space it's, you know, I do enjoy the process of establishing a garden, but I would really love to establish a garden and then not have to move away from it a year or two years later and to just continue to build upon it. That would be really wonderful. So I think homeownership or owning land like is a big challenge. And then the other challenge I would say is the burnout because I tend to go really hard at this and really hard at a lot of things in my life. By the time august rolls around or september rolls around like you said there's a hundred pounds of tomatoes and i'm like f that i don't even want to look at the garden i don't want to think about the garden i don't want to do any like i want nothing to do with it but then in january i'm like oh i miss it you know and it's it's a cycle right i think like it's taught me a lot about life actually <laughs> and how to manage <laughs> the ebb and flow of life of how sometimes you might be more into things and less into things and you're starting and stopping and you might need a break. It's taught me how to take a break because there's a very forced break in the winter with homesteading and gardening, unless you have like a covered, you know, greenhouse or whatever, but I don't, um, I don't use any row covers or anything really because historically I, I don't really know how to turn my energy off. And I will just like power through the burnout and it just gets like worse and worse. But I kind of feed off of that chaos, I guess. But the winter season with gardening has taught me how to just winter in life and like really rest deeply during that period. So I think that seasonality is really nice to it. So then in a perfect world, if you had your perfect setup, what would that look like? Would you have different animals? You know, would you still have quail or would you do chickens? How big would your garden be? Like, what what is the perfect balance for you? Ideally, I would definitely not have quail. I would only recommend quail for someone who is in a small space where they cannot have chickens. I think something I've started to realize through butchering my own meat is the cost of a life. And how many calories are you getting per life? You know, and so that's led me to think about raising larger livestock for meat. Um, I definitely want to have a dairy cow at some point or a few dairy cows because they usually need friends. So I want to have a mini Jersey cow. That's my goal because they're mm -hmm. they're pretty small. They're really like kind of easier to manage than a big, you know, <laughs> thousand pound cow. But I also eat a lot of dairy, drink a lot of milk, so I think that would be good for me. I don't have any digestive problems with milk. Um, <laughs> and then I would definitely raise 
meat chickens, have laying chickens as well. Maybe try some other type of birds, like try to have guinea hens or... I don't think I would try turkeys. Um, I don't know if they're worth it. They're not. <laughs> chickens are just really functional, too. Ch chickens are great for tilling. They're great for scratching and whatever. They do a lot of things, and they're cute. Um, like silkies, so cute, but probably so hard to keep clean. <laughs> so, yeah, I think ultimately dairy cattle, chickens for meat. Oh, I definitely want to have pigs also for meat because I eat pork. Although. Yeah, piglets would be tough. I don't think I would ever butcher piglets, but, you know. What other meat animals am I missing? Some people Eat? like goat or a sheep or... Nah. I think... Yeah. Would you do beef cow? Do whatever you want. Beef, beef, pork, and chicken are the only things I, I really eat. Like, I just want to replace what I buy from the store with what I can produce on the homestead, right? And then in terms of the garden, I'd like to have a garden that's as hands-off as possible but still produces a lot. So I would probably set up an irrigation system. I would like to ideally not have to have a tractor. I would like to be able to do everything by hand, but still spend minimal time on it, if that makes sense. Um, so I would probably just have like a hundred foot row of potatoes and a hundred foot row of onions and a hundred foot, you know, just really kind of make it standardized. But I don't know how big that would be, however big it needs to be to, produce all my produce right and then a field of wheat or sorghum or some kind of grain maybe rice really interested in that um but you know once you start factoring in grain production and like cattle the acreage <laughs> starts to really skyrocket so i can't really pinpoint what what acreage i would need for that perfect homestead because yeah, it might require, like, to really be self-sufficient, it might require, like, 30 acres, you know. But I think five acres, for someone who's also working a full-time job and has a family, is, like, probably a good, <laughs> good amount to manage. Do you think you would lean into, like, a perennial area? Because that's really hands-off once you get established, right? Totally. I am super interested in edible perennials. I'm really interested in them, especially like perennial vegetables and they're doing some research recently on trying to create a perennial grain that you can harvest from and that's for like developing countries to help them produce or like in more arid mm -hmm. regions like in Africa so that would be really interesting but yeah perennials and then mushrooms are also something I'm trying to grow this year but I don't really like mushrooms <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's again, it's just for the learning experience and they're good for you. And I don't know, I think it would be cool to just give me all your food. <laughs> okay, I have one more question, a follow up. Do you think that you want to stay in this area, like in North Carolina, or would you be like interested in moving elsewhere? It's a great question, actually. <laughs> that is a really good question. I don't know. Appalachia feels like home to me. I've lived on the East Coast my entire life. I have some really amazing friends here. Um, my family is kind of far away. And so that for me is a little bit of a pain point. Also, the primary issue for me is there's not much of an economy in Asheville if you're not working in the service industry or in hospitality. And so if I do want a full-time job that is fulfilling to me and engaging, it feels like I have to go somewhere else. If I stay in Asheville, I probably have to really lean into the lifestyle here, which is a lot more laid back, a lot more living off the land. And it's not a choice that I want to make. I, I wish I could have both, but that's just not how it's working out, at least right now. So again, I think I, I would have a homestead wherever I go because um, that's important to me to maintain. But yeah, I do really like this region. I think it would be beautiful to have a life here long term but we'll see you know i might come back one day i think that that's likely what will happen is i might circle back to this area but um yeah it's also a place that's really easy to grow food i think um because it rains a lot the summers are hot and sunny it's a relatively long growing season um we don't have any like crazy natural disasters or anything like it's a very safe 
area in terms of climate effects. Um, mm-hmm. And the community here for sustainable agriculture is impeccable. There's so many, it's like a hub for growing your own food and having this self-sufficient lifestyle. It attracts so many people here that are into that sort of thing. So I think if you're looking to learn these kinds of skills, Asheville is the place to be, <laughs> like, honestly. You already said that you've contemplated quitting. So I guess a better question would be, what's the closest that you have ever come to quitting? I think, hmm. Stumped. That's a really good question. This past season, I got really burnt out. <laughs> I think also, the better I do during the growing season, the more burnt out I get at the end of it. But what has really helped me combat that has been again putting systems in place that give me my time back so like this year i got sprinklers oh my god (laughs) it changed my life because previously i've always just watered by hand every single day during the summertime which is a lot of water but also because i have beds that i turn so frequently i don't have mulch all over the beds and i'm also trying to cram all the crops in so i don't want to put straw everywhere and it gets really messy and hard to like get in and out of the mulch so i just have like soil that's more or less exposed and so i have to water a lot because it evaporates more quickly but yeah sprinklers game changing this year i'm gonna build an automatic feeding and watering system for my quail so that i can go on vacation for like a week and not have to have someone come feed them every single day which is going to be great for my friends because then they don't have to deal with like <laughs> feeders that are covered in shit. So that's going to be awesome. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on here, but <laughs> but yeah, I think every year I kind of think about it a little bit. I think about quitting, <laughs> um, but it's not to the point where I'm going to throw my hands up and say, oh, I'm never doing this again. It's just kind yeah. of like, man. I'm really tired. I don't know if I can like finish it out in the way that I want to finish it out. And sometimes that feels bad. You know, like I always want to finish the season strong and I want to do my fall garden. I want to be really productive through the winter and have my winter garden. And then it just never happens. Um, And I think that's okay. And every year I'm getting closer to that goal of like having a winter garden, but we're not there yet. And so giving myself grace for that is important. Also giving myself grace for like when there's other things happening in my life that take a lot of attention or drain me emotionally and physically. And I frankly just like don't have the willpower to go do the things I need to do in my garden that are going to pay off later. But, you know, sometimes again, when it's July, August, like I want to be doing other things. I want to be spending the sunny days that I have off of work going and hiking or spending them with my friends, you know, not like, I don't know, pulling weeds or spreading mulch. (laughs) Being your friend and being close, you know, to you and seeing what you get enjoyment out of. I think there is a part of you that really, really enjoys, and this isn't a criticism because I do it too, but accepting a challenge that really, truly pushes you to like almost your actual limit. And seeing how close you can get there without going mm. over, I think I think you as a person really deeply enjoy that challenge. Oh yeah, that's that's probably true. If you tell me something's impossible, I'm gonna say like, oh. this. <laughs> Sage asked if you have come close to quitting before. Has homesteading or hobby farming ever like being immersed in it? Has it ever made you want to quit everything else? Yeah, I think it's hard to answer. I think my answer is kind of yes and no, because I haven't been as fully immersed in it as I want to be. You know, like, I'm not living off the land as much as I want to be. I think maybe if I had a bigger property where I was actually growing the scale of food that I want to grow, you know, maybe I'd be a lot more inclined to quit my job and just do that. I think my goal was a self-sufficiency is to not have to work. You know, I want my work to just be kind of supplementary, um, to have more like money to use in the world as like a tool, you know, but not have to sustain off of money. Like if, if the whole economic system collapsed and if the grid collapsed, like I could still survive and my community could survive. Mm-hmm. But 
I did kind of do that very recently with my beekeeping escapade. That was much more of like, I wanted to challenge myself to face this personal fear that I had of like stepping away from the path that I had always followed. And I was enjoying my path, but it was also the path that my parents set me on society at large was, you know, encouraging. I've always had just like nine to fives that make good money. And granted, it's doing something in sustainability that I find very fulfilling. But I had never taken that risk to do something different or do something more hands on. And there's a lot of reasons why I'm going back into the other job, which I won't get into right now. But maybe later in life, it'll circle back. Yeah, I think life ebbs and flows. Right now, I don't think it's something I necessarily want to do full time. I also think because having money does afford you a lot of freedoms that frankly, like, are important to me, like, having peace of mind with my health care, having peace of mind if I need to go travel to see my family or maintain relationships with friends that I have all across the country to take vacations um, so that I am not constantly burnt out from this or that. Um, those things are important to me. I also want to have a family one day. And it's important to me that I have financial security for my future children. Could I raise kids on a homestead and would they turn out fine and be safe? Probably. But it just feels much more risky to me. And I don't know how comfortable I, I feel with bringing other people into that situation that couldn't choose it for themselves. So with working a full-time job and having these hobbies on the side, how do you find that you balance those? Um, I have a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's hard sometimes, you know? Like I said, I think I get burnt out, especially in the middle of the growing season when there's things that need to get done for the garden that if I don't do it, then I'll get less production later or, you know, I'll regret it later for some reason if I if I don't just like stick to my schedule that I've planned out ideally. But it's it's hard. I mean, I have to know when to pull back a lot of the times because I do put a big priority on other things in my life, like my social life and just like resting and sitting around and doing nothing sometimes. For me, the, the homestead requires a lot of willpower. <laughs> like, it's not this thing that I kind of just lose myself in. And it is recharging for me, but it is exhausting to have days and days and days on end when you work from 9 to 5, and then you go straight to the garden until 10 p.m., and then you just basically eat dinner and go to bed, right? Like, there's literally no break in that. Um, and for me, I need more aspects of my life to feel fulfilled I can't just sustain off of like work and gardening because I get lonely I'm also a very extroverted person and so I need socialization to recharge which I know is different than the hosts of this such podcast. a wild <laughs> concept to me and Michaela yeah yeah well I think that's a big part I can't of it. I can't fathom it yeah. So the garden is recharging in a in a sense that it's good for me to like move my body and it turns my brain off from like working really hard intellectually, although it's very intellectual in a different way. <laughs> but when I'm alone for too long, I just I don't do well. Um, even if I have the garden, it's just not enough for me. You got to love it. You got to really love it and just make time for it, but also be gentle with yourself if you can't do all the things you were hoping to do, because you'll just do them next year or not. Maybe. And that's OK. It's all OK. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who's looking to do what you do, what would it be? I would say start growing something now. <laughs> if all you can grow in is a red solo cup on your windowsill or under a tiny grow light <laughs> do it if you just buy some random seeds or you i don't know you know pick some flowers outside if you grow them inside like grow something i think some people get so hung up on this idea that they have this black thumb or they can't grow anything i had never grown a single thing before I built an entire, I mean, I grew some like mint. Okay. <laughs> Anyone can grow mint. Like I had, I had never really grown anything or had plants before I built an entire 
garden and then I just like dove into it you know I spent hundreds of dollars on like wood and compost and this and that and not a shovel but I grew a bunch of stuff and I did really good in my last year I think as long as you do your research you know and learn some basic concepts like where does the sun go like is this plant a sun loving plant or can it tolerate shade how much water does it need you know i think if you have a high quality like compost base or soil something nutritious that the plants can grow in and you water it every now and then and it gets adequate sunlight you can grow food so if people want to find you if they want to follow you support you are there any ways to do that not really. I'm not really on the internet, but I talk to Sage all the time. So <laughs> if you have any questions for me, feel free to direct them to her and we'll do our best to answer, you know, and I'd love to engage with this community. It's really amazing what these two have built. So, you know, definitely want to continue being a part of it and do that beekeeping episode. So stay <laughs> tuned for that. I'll definitely be back. <laughs> yeah. If people have questions for you, you know, please feel free to leave those down below. We will get the questions to her and and relay that. It, it might come from a she said homestead response, but trust that it's Chrissy. Email us if you want to ask a like more private question or like a longer question, or you can comment below. Well, I know you're my friend. I know that you're here all the time, but I appreciate you coming on the podcast and letting us interrogate you and pick your brain and uh, sharing your life and your perspectives with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and it was really fun. So yeah, excited for next time. <laughs> we can't wait to have you back. Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at she said homestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.